Let's pray. Loving Father, we are so thankful for your presence that is with us. Truly, Lord, I feel your presence amongst us, and we are so thankful. Thank you, Father, for your loving kindness, and Lord, we are just amazed. I am amazed at your love and your great compassion towards us. Father, we don't deserve it, but you are constantly pursuing us with such matchless love, and we just want to thank you so much. Father, we cannot fully comprehend who you are. There's times when we receive flashes of your character within our minds, and I, I just weep, Lord, as I see your great love, and we could not ask for a better God than the God we have now. So my heart is filled with gratitude, Lord, as I see how compassionate and loving you have been towards me, and I know you have been towards your children as well. Thank you so much, Father, for what you are doing for us. And Lord, I truly pray for your guidance now as we are about to study into a topic I believe is so, so important. Lord, I really pray for the guidance of your spirit. I pray, Father, for those who might be standing on the brink of making a decision which will ruin their own souls if they make a wrong decision on this point. And Father, I just pray as well as we go further with the study, that you please, Lord, do something special for the homes of your people. Please, Father, I really pray for your guidance. I pray for power, pray for conviction, and I pray and ask, Lord, may changes be made within every home. We hear these wonderful truths we're going to study. Please bless us now, Father, and abide with us. May your spirit please instruct us. May our hearts be opened up to receive all the truth heaven will impart. And Father, we know that truth is not truth that is not love, that is not practice, and that is not imparted. So please, Father, as you teach us these wonderful things, may you help us by your grace to love in harmony with these truths. We love you, and we ask these mercies humbly, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, what we're going to study today We're not going to study it, we're not going to complete the study, but we're just going to start it. Um, I believe there's a close, intimate link, a very, very close, intimate link between the Adventist home and the final crisis, the National Sunday Law. And yeah, God has just been making things so clear to me personally in my study of the importance of an Adventist home. Like, this has been something he's been impressing on my heart and he's been sharing a lot of things with me concerning the importance of an Adventist home. And I'm convinced, I'm truly convinced that unless we have an Adventist home, you're not going to receive the seal. I'm convinced. What I'm also going to say I'm convinced of is that if one makes a wrong decision, I'm talking to those, this study is going to be divided up into two, to the unmarried and then to the married. If one makes a wrong decision, do you know what God had shown me in the Bible? In this week, he had shown me that the very things one needs to reject the mark of the peace, you won't believe it, is the very same two things one needs to choose a life partner. Do you know it's the exact same things? The exact same things. That's Bible. That is Bible. And what God showed that if one makes a wrong decision on the issue of a life partner, definitely you're going to receive the mark. Now, listen to what I'm saying. If somebody is married already, that does not apply. I'm saying it's true someone can be married, unconverted, both unconverted people come to the altar, marry. And then later on, the one partner can meet Jesus. That, that, that's fine. And let me say this. 
Normally, it's, the, it's normally the second love that has the stronger love. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. It's normally the second love that has the stronger hold upon the heart. Let me illustrate, what, let me help you understand what I'm saying. When somebody first, if they first, they're converted and they meet, they, they, they get converted through Jesus, and then they meet someone, and the heaven does not approve of the relationship, but they take the step anyway. Do you know what happens? The love for this new lover overbalances the love for their former lover. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. That means their love for the new lover overbalance and they are more inclined to do what their partner says than what Jesus says. But when somebody is unconverted, both are unconverted and they marry, and then that one person meets Jesus, you know what happens? The new love overbalances the love of the former love. That's how it operates. So I'm not saying if somebody is married and then, they, how am I going to, no, no, no. We are talking for those who are about to take the step or are contemplating taking the step, if you make a wrong decision now, yeah, you're in trouble, serious trouble. Now, we want to look at the issue of the, the Adventist home. Now, maybe before, let me say this. Let me, let me put this on the board. What I believe there's a link between the family and the Sabbath. Do you believe this, friends? There's a link between the family and the Sabbath. There's a link between the two. And I believe that if we fail here, we would fail here. I want to share this quotation, which is not new to us. I'm reading from the book Great Controversy. Great Controversy. I'm reading from page 605. Now listen to what the prophet says in Great Controversy, page 605. She says, The Sabbath will be the greatest of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted. Now I want you to see what she calls the Sabbath issue. She says, When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction shall be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. So what she is saying, that the Sabbath issue is the final test. This is the final test we're going to go through. It's the issue of the Sabbath. Now would you like to know, if you're going to pass the final test, would you, would you love to know, would I pass the final test when it comes? I'm going to suggest this. What shows whether you're going to pass the final test is the home life. If you are constantly failing in the home life, you are not going to pass the final test. The Sabbath and the family, friends, are closely linked together. They are closely, closely linked together. I want you to see this quotation. This is from the book Education, page 250. Listen to what the prophet of God says. She says, The Sabbath and the family were alike instituted in Eden and in God's purpose they are indissolubly linked together. What is she saying is indissolubly linked together? The Sabbath and the family. Do you know what does indissolubly mean? Do you know what that means? Indissolubly linked together. They, you know, I looked up the word indissolubly. I said, what is this when the prophet says that the, Sab the family and the Sabbath are indissolubly linked together? So I looked up this word indissolubly. And this is from the dictionary Sister White used. It says here, in a manner resisting separation. What? The Sabbath and the family, what? They resist what? Separation. You cannot separate them. So if, if you cannot separate it, let me ask you this. She said, because she says indissolubly linked together. And what the dictionary is telling me indissolubly means it cannot be separated. It continues, it says, firmly united beyond the power of separation in a manner not to be dissolved or broken. So the family and the Sabbath are indissolubly linked together. It cannot be separated. Impossible. Inspiration is saying it is indissolubly linked together. So that means then, my home life, how I, how I live within my home, will determine whether I get the seal or the mark of the peace. This is the final test. But this is, I'm going to say, my daily test. And how you, do you know that if somebody keeps failing throughout the year, they keep failing every test, they keep failing every test, 
Don't you think when they come to the final test, they're also going to fail it? So what we believe, I'm saying based on inspiration, that these two things are indissolubly linked together. This is my final test. And this is my daily test. And how I manage, manage my daily test, my family, how, I'm, how, how, how do I operate in my family determines whether I get the seal of God or not. Now what I'm going to suggest I want you to see something interesting. Come in your Bible to Revelation 12. Revelation 12, before I say that, come with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation the 12th chapter. I want us to see Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12, I want us to read verse 17 before we pause and pray. Revelation 12, verse 17. Now, before I read this verse, it's going to describe war. But before I read this, I want you to understand something in the physical, so you can understand something in the spiritual. Do you know during, during World War, do you know that the Germans stopped using bullets upon, upon the people that had no guns? They said, we are wasting ammunition. We, we are wasting our bullets. With we are trying to be killing people, but there's no need to use our ammunition upon people that can't kill us, can't do, do us any harm. So you know what they decided to do? Put them in gas chambers, put them in different places, but they chose not to use their bullets. Why? They said we are wasting ammunition. I want you to see Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. This is going to tell us about war. Revelation 12, verse 17. It says, And the dragon was wrought with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now let's pause there. What is Satan, who is Satan going to make war with? The remnant. Now who is the remnant? The Seventh Adventist Church, God's people. He's going to seek to make war with them. This is Bible. He's going to seek to make war. Now let me ask you this. When you're in war and you want to actually get an opponent down, what do you shoot for? Do you shoot for the toe? Do you shoot for the hand? What, 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 what do you go for? Won't you say you go for a vital organ? A vital organ. Either the head, the heart, something that is vital, something that once you get this, the whole body shuts down. So if Satan wants to shut down God's church, the Seventh-day Adventist church is going to make war, what do you think he's going to attack? A vital organ. He's not going to attack the hand. He's not going to attack the, the feet. Is going to go specifically for a vital organ. Now, my question publicly, what does the Bible say is a vital organ? Come with me. What is that? Come with me to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. What is a vital organ? Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs the fourth chapter. Proverbs 4, I want us to see what does the Bible say is a vital organ. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. It says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So based on the Bible, what is a vital organ? A heart, specifically the heart. So when Satan's going to attack the church, he's going to make war on the church. And the war, specifically in its final phase, will be a National Sunday law. That's the final phase of the war. But what if Satan wants to bring down the church, will he go after? What does God say? The heart. The heart. So if Satan wants to bring down the Seventh-day Adventist church just before the great crisis, the National Sunday law, he's going to go for the heart. Now my question is this, what is the heart of the church? What is it? Watch Adventist on page 15. She says, society is composed of families and it is what the heads of families make it. Out of the heart, very verse we are reading, are the issues of life and the heart of the community of the church and of the nation is the household. The well-being of society, the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation depend upon home influences. 
So then what if Satan wants to shut down the Seventh-day Adventist church, but a person of a national Sunday law is going to take the heart? What is the heart based on the Bible? What is inspiration? The home. The home. The home. If Satan wants to shut down the church, all he needs to do is attack the home. That's all he needs to do. Make sure that home is divided. Family against, a home divided against itself, Jesus says, cannot stand. And the question in Revelation 7, who shall be able to stand? It's the 144,000. The 144,000. Now, my question is this, friends. This is my question. What is Satan's great attack is the heart. What is the heart of the church? The home. Now, my next question is, what is a home? What's a definition of a home? What is a definition of an Adventist home? Inspiration says in the book Adventist Home, home is all that the word implies, a little heaven on earth. It should be all what the word, the word implies, a little heaven on earth. Now, my question is this, is your home a little heaven on earth? Is your home a little heaven on earth? Do you know that an Adventist home is not actually given to you? Do you know that an Adventist home is developed? It's not given, it's developed. You say, what do I mean? I want you to see this. Come up in your Bible to Psalms 127. Psalms chapter 127. Psalms 127. Psalms chapter 127. Psalms 127, verse 1. Psalms 127, verse 1. It says, Except the Lord build a house, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake it but in vain. Based on this verse, how, does a, how is our home developed based on this verse? Sorry? That is partially true. L look at the verse carefully. It's, uh, take notice, not just the Lord. It says, except the Lord build it, they labor in vain. So do you see there's two people that build a home? It's the Lord and it's they, labor. So in order to have an Adventist home, there's two parties that must be involved. It's the day that labor and it's the Lord. It cannot be done just by the couple and it cannot just be done by the Lord as well. It needs to be a cooperation of divinity and humanity in order for an Adventist home to be developed. An Adventist home is not given, friends. Neither is character given. Character is developed. An Adventist home is developed. It is not given. It is not given. Now, it's not our study today to look at what is an Adventist home. What is a little heaven on earth? What I'm going to suggest is this is what God says, that this is what he wants every home to look like, a little heaven on earth. And what I'm going to suggest, unless we are studying the book Adventist home, you'll never have a little heaven on earth. God would not spend so much time instructing a prophet, giving such clear instruction, and that book is not picked up, and we say, I'm making it to the final crisis. Impossible. That book has to be picked up, it has to be read. An Adventist home, friends, has to be. I, 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 there's no way it can come about without studying prayerfully that book, Adventist home. It must be studied prayerfully, and not reading entire chapters and getting nothing, even if it's just two paragraphs, three paragraphs, and, and fully understanding what those three paragraphs are saying. Today is not my study to specifically look at that. We'll look at it another time, maybe Sabbath, God willing. We'll study specifically what is an Advent, Adventist home based on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. What does it look like? But today I want to go somewhere else before we go there. I want us to look at this issue specifically on the issue of courtship. This, I believe, is most essential, that if one gets this issue wrong, I believe then everything else fails. I want us to see something interesting. Come with me to Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs the 7th chapter. 
Proverbs 7. Actually, you know what? Before Proverbs 7, come up in your Bible to Revelation chapter 13. Revelations, the 13th chapter. Revelations chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. I want us to read verse 18. Revelations 13, verse 18. Are we there? Revelations 13, verse 18. Now, I'm going to read verse 18, and I want you to tell me what does one need in order to understand the number 666, to understand the peace and avoid it. Look at Revelation 13, verse 18. It says, Here is wisdom. Let him that had understanding count the number of the beast, for there's a number of a man and his number 666. What are, the, what are the things that the Bible mentions before you actually understand anything about the beast? You must first have. What are the two things? Wisdom and understanding. So does God place wisdom and understanding in order to avoid the mock, to understand what's it? Does God say these are the two things you need? You need wisdom and you need understanding in order to understand what's the beast, the image, the mock, and to avoid it. Now come with me in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs the seventh chapter. Proverbs chapter seven. Proverbs seven. I want us to see Proverbs seven from verse four. Proverbs seven from verse four. Listen to what God says what one needs in order to avoid a strange woman, in order not to enter into a relationship with a strange woman or a strange man, you can put it vice versa. It says, say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy king's woman. So what are we talking about in verse four? What are the two things? Wisdom and understanding. And then look what God says in verse five, if you have wisdom and understanding. He says that they might keep thee from the strange woman and from the stranger which flattereth with the words. What are the two things God says you need in order to avoid choosing the wrong partner? Wisdom and understanding. What are the two things God says in Revelation 13 you need to calculate the number of the beast and avoid it? Wisdom and understanding. Is there a link with developing a family and the final crisis over the mark of the beast? There's a clear link, friends. There is a clear link. There is a clear link. I'm going to pause, we're going to pray, and then we'll resume. Very short study. It's not going to be an exhaustive study. We'll just introduce it now. Let us kneel, those who can. Loving Father, we humbly approach your throne, Lord, with much humility of heart. Please, Father, may you guide us now as we seek to understand something concerning the final crisis and the development of the Adventist home. Please, Lord, may you teach us and instruct us. And please, Father, I just pray, may you save many a soul that is on a verge of making a grave mistake on this issue. We are told in inspiration upon this rock, this rock of misunderstanding and going forward in courtship and marriage that heaven does not approve of. On this rock, thousands have made shipwreck of their faith. And Father, I'm really pleading that as we study, please, Lord, whatever soul is on the brink of making a wrong decision, please, Lord, we just pray may you push back the powers of darkness. May their eyes be open and may they avoid the trap that Satan has set for their feet not only for those who are on the verge of making this decision, but even those who have already formed their home, we just pray, Lord, that the principles we'll study in a future lesson might be adopted within the heart and within the home. And may such homes be developed that are little heavens on earth. Please, Father, bless us now and abide with us, for we ask these things humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Now, there are two things that God says must actually be developed, or we must have in order to actually make a right decision in the, in the issue of marriage, courtship. What are the two things that he mentions? Understand. Wisdom and understanding. These are the two things God says must be actually, actually he says that wisdom and understanding will actually guide you and it will cause you to, to avoid the strange woman. Now, you can also put advice first that wisdom and understanding will guide a woman to avoid a strange man, any which way. So these are the two things God says is needed. Now, who must select for you then? A, a life partner. What, what does God say in the Bible? <laughs> wisdom and understanding must do it. Not, he says wisdom and understanding will keep thee. Actually, you know what? When you go to Proverbs 11, 22, God says, you know, one of the things which many men, gets, they get become dazed with is beauty. They get dazed, and that's what, what happened with, with Jezebel. Jezebel thought she would gaze Jehu. When Jehu came, she painted her face, she tied her hair, she tried to doll herself up, and she stood by the w w w uh, window, and she tried to induce Jehu, and Jehu never even entertained her. He said, throw the woman down. Throw the woman down. Now, in Proverbs 11, 22, the Bible says that as a jewel of gold, as in a swine snout, so is a fair woman without discretion. You know what's a fair woman? A beautiful woman without discretion. So God says that a beautiful woman without discretion is like a pig that just has a jewel of gold within her nose. Now my question is, does that whole pig become valuable because of a little jewel of gold that's within its dirty nose? No. So God says in Proverbs chapter 11 verse 22 that when you look for a partner, he says don't become dazed with outer beauty. Don't be dazed. He said, now, when I looked at that verse, I said, Lord, what, what do you mean that a woman without discretion is like a swine or like a jewel of gold in a swine's snout? And I looked up that word discretion publicly. Discretion, because God says that beauty without discretion, he says, is useless. It is nothing. So I looked up the word discretion. Now, friends, someone says, why, why are you dealing with this thing? The issue of courtship and marriage. Do you know inspiration says, upon this rock, you know what rock she's referring to? She says misunderstanding or the issue of courtship and marriage. She says on this rock, the issue of courtship and the issue of marriage on this rock, Thousands have made shipwreck of their faith. She says men who are sensible on every other point, every other point of truth, she says on this one point they make shipwreck of their faith. The issue of courtship and marriage. The strongest man on this earth, Samson, physically strong, he made shipwreck on the, over his faith on the issue of marriage. The wisest man on this earth, outside of Jesus, Solomon, he made shipwreck of his faith over the issue of marriage. And David, one of the most spiritual men, God says, a man after my own heart, he made shipwreck over this issue. So Proverbs 11. Now, maybe before I even go to Proverbs 11 and deal with this thing, someone says, why again the issue of courtship and marriage? Do you know inspiration says, in the book Adventist homepage 45, in Adventist homepage 45, friends, you know, as I'm re going through the book Adventist home, I've been praying and thanking God. You know what my prayer has been? Lord, I am so thankful that these principles are becoming more clear before, I've t before I, I, I took the step. I am really thankful because I'm saying if one would take those principles and they would actually use them. You know, you know what, what we put on when you want to see something clear? What do you put on, your, you put on to see glasses? Do you know Adventist home is like glasses for you, brother, if you are looking? It gives you clarity of vision. So that when you look, you can see clearly. Sometimes you can be dazed. So the glasses put you looking at something you can't see. <laughs> Once you put the glasses, you can see. Oh, now I can see. <laughs> so the book Adventist, I'm just saying, Lord, I am so thankful. The first, the first 30 chapters, I can't go past them. I'm, I can't go. Every time I try, I can't. I'm not successful. Why? The principles there, I read, I go back. I, I'm saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you for preserving me. Now, if you're already married, inspiration says in the book Adventist Home, 
Christ can take the common waters and he can turn it into the wine of heaven. That means if your marriage is boring, he can take common water and turn it into the wine of heaven. But he's not going to do it. How is the Adventist home developed again? Is it given? Or what does Psalm say? What does Psalm say? What is that? No, 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 no. Whoa, 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 whoa. The wisdom and understanding, wait. Wisdom and understanding is choosing a life partner. Choosing a life partner. This is choosing a life partner. Now, how is an Adventist, an Adventist home is a little heaven. Now, how is a little heaven, how, how does this come about? Thank you. It says, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain. So in order for an Adventist home to be developed, you need God, divinity, and you need humanity combined to get an Adventist home. We're going to study on Sabbath. How is this developed? Friends, interesting. And if I'm going to say the Adventist home, majority of it weighs upon the Father. I'm saying of developing an Adventist home, majority of it weighs upon the Father. They can, now listen, I'm saying if husband and wife are Adventists, I'm saying majority weighs on the Father, the husband. You say, what do I mean? Friends, listen, what is, what, what a home, what, what is the definition of a home? A little heaven on earth. So a home should be a replica of what? Heaven. So how does heaven look? I'm saying as a father, you are a husband, you, are, you should study how does heaven look. I want my own church to be like heaven. Jesus, one of the first principles Jesus taught us, he taught us how to pray. Our father, which art where? In heaven. Oh, Jesus teaching us about who? Our father where? In heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. And then it goes on to say, Father, lead me what? not into temptation. So in an Adventist home or in heaven, who leads in heaven? Father. So in a true Adventist home, who should lead? Father. One of the first principles Jesus taught us is to pray. And in that prayer it says, in heaven the Father leads. So in a true Adventist home, not mother, not child, that is not an Adventist home. In a true Adventist home, the Father leads. But I wonder how the Father in heaven leads. I wonder how he leads. Does he lead arbitrary or does he lead in love? He leads in love. He leads in love. Now, I'm not going to go on with the issue of, of we'll, we'll study that on Sabbath. Now, a, a little heaven on earth, we said, how, how does this come about? It's developed by how? God plus what? Plus the family. God plus the family. It's not just the family and it's not just God. It's both of them. Now, I want to come back to this issue of choosing. Because inspiration says, actually one more quotation in this wonderful book. In this wonderful book, do you know there are specific books that specifically deal with how to live? I'm saying from the home and then it boils over outside of the home. Adventist home, ministry of healing and messages to young people and child guidance. I'm saying those books should compose family devotions, as a fam specifically those books, because they deal on how to live not only in the home, it starts within the home and it goes out, out, outside of the home. So those four books must specifically be devotional books. Now in this book, Messages to Young People, page 455, let me ask you a question. What do you think is Satan's most successful tactic to destroy the human family? What do you think, out of everything Satan can pull out of his arsenal, what do you think is the most successful that he has within, out of all his deceptions that he can pull out to bring the most misery to the human family? I'm saying out of all the deceptions of Satan, what do you think he... he <laughs> you know what she says? 
in the book messages to young people, she says Satan is busily engaged, is busily engaged in uniting those who are wholly unsuited to each other to unite their interest. He exults in this work, for by it he can cause more misery and hopeless woe to the human family than by exercising his cunning in any other direction. So what does she say that if Satan wants to bring the most misery to the human family, all he needs to do is unite two people who are wholly unsuited for each other. She says he exults in this work. Like she says, there's nothing he can do to bring more misery to the human family, to, the human, to humans on this planet, than causing them to unite with people they're only unsuited to. Now my question is, friends, I'm coming back to, I'm coming back to this issue of courtship. My question is this issue, a little heaven on earth. Now, I'm going to suggest this. There's only two options. If it's not a heaven, then what is it? hell. You can't tell me, no, no, it's not a heaven and it's not a hell. Then I'm going to say then you got an issue because you condemn the Catholic Church for purgatory. But you want to say your home's a purgatory. It's not a hell and it's not a heaven. It's in between. Friends, there's no such. Publicly show me where's purgatory. There's no such purgatory. Your home cannot be a purgatory. It's either a little heaven or it's a hell. And I'm going to suggest to you, based not on my statistics, based on God's statistics, majority of Adventist homes, inspiration says it, as actually she says, a gaily yoke. The, the inspiration says this. I want you to see what she says. She says marriage, Adventist home page 44, marriage in a majority of cases is a most gaily yoke. There are thousands that are mated but not matched. What does she say that in many cases, well, what word does the prophet use here? She says, in majority of cases, marriage is a what? A most scaling yoke. You know, it's interesting when you read volume 5 of the testimony, it's 136. She says, soon God's church will be tested with fiery trials and a great proportion of those who now appear to be genuine or proved to be base metal. Then she goes on to say, she's talking about the Sunday law, then she goes on to say, she says, to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. How many people are going to forsake the Sabbath and go out, out? What word does she use? Majority. And how many does she say marriages is the Kaelin yoke? Majority. Are you seeing that there's a link between marriage and the family and a link between the Sunday law. How many marriages are gay in yoke? How many based on inspiration are gonna leave the Seventh-day Adventist church and accept Sunday law majority? So can you see that if your marriage, if your family is a gay in yoke, your marriage, inspiration is saying, it's just an indication when the Sunday law comes, you're gonna leave and go out. That's all inspiration is teaching us. There's a clear link between family and the Sabbath. And you know how beautiful it is when you learn these principles before you take the step. But thank God that even if you can't, you did take the step. Inspiration says, you know what inspiration says in the book Adventist Home? She says, I saw that your marriage was a deception of the devil. She says, nevertheless, you are to make the best of it. Question, who married that woman, whoever the prophet, I don't know who was that woman, but who married her? She said, Satan married you. She says, but nonetheless, make the best of it. And she says, she actually goes on in that, she actually says that she, basically she's comforting the sister because the sister's married to a demon. She's comforting and she says, make it for your husband as pleasant as you can because this is all the heaven is going to have. Friends, do you know how, do you know how solemn this thing is? The issue, do you know, you know, if you go back and you study Genesis 6, what led to the close of human probation? I want you to see, come with me to Genesis 6. Come with me to Genesis 6. I want you to see what led to the close of human probation. And you know what? As you come into Genesis 6, do you know many people are, actually she says, ish, ish, ish. I don't know if you, there are people, she, inspiration says, <laughs> hey, they are almost, she uses the word, what, what word does she use? Like they are a mania, you know when you're mad over this issue? Mania. Ma mania. When, you, when, it, when you're consuming the mind. And she says, you know what? 
I want, I want those who are not married to understand this. She says, if ever the thought comes into your mind that you will not be happy except you get married, she says, that is a suggestion from the devil. God never brings such a suggestion. That's in the book Adventist Home. And Satan can whisper, you know what, you need to get married. And then he got someone for you, he wants to marry you. Do you know Satan wants to, the unmarried, he wants to marry you. Satan wants to marry the unmarried. <laughs> In the wrong marriage, brother. Now we're not saying it's a, marriage is wonderful, but we are saying, you know what, oh friends, I mean, there's a man, and actually, I'm going all over the show, but there's a man, <laughs> there's a man that inspiration actually specifically speaks of, that when we send him, he was the best, one of the best Adventists they had. I'm saying out of the pioneers now, I'm not talking about, but back in, in the, our pioneers, it was Jay and Andrews. The man had memorized the entire Bible. The entire Bible, the man had memorized it. And actually inspiration says, when we send Jay and Andrews as a missionary, we are sending our best. Now, do you know that Jay and Andrews was married and Jay and Andrews had children? Now, before I go on and tell you what happened with Jane Andrews, he actually was married, he had children, his wife died, I believe at the age of 40-something. And Jane Andrews was sent to Europe. Before I show you what inspiration says, let's first see what James White said about Jane Andrews, and then I'm going to go to what inspiration says, just to understand who is Jane Andrews. I want you to see this quotation. This is from James White. This is what James White said about Jane Andrews. Jane Andrews is the one in the center there. It says, he continued his labors almost to the very close of his life. Talking about Jane Andrews, he continued his labors to the very close of, close of his life. Few men have left behind them a record of greater purity of life or more earnest effort for Christ and humanity. His, you can see that, labors did more perhaps than those of any other man to develop Bible evidence of the, the views advocated by this people. So let's just stop there. What, 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 what James White is saying, that there's very few men that came on the scene and left the scene with such purity of life, that labored so zealously even to the point of death than J. N. Andrews. And he says out of all the men that we had in this movement, he says J. N. Andrews was one of the key men in developing the views that we as seven Adventists hold to. So this man was greatly used of God, greatly, greatly used of God. Now, I want you to see this quotation. Ellen White wrote to J. N. Andrews just before, actually, she had to counsel him before he was leaving to Europe. You know what was, what was her counsel to Jane Andrews? <laughs> the counsel to Jane Andrews was, you need to get a wife before you go to Europe. God actually, this, uh, this great man of God, who God was using in a mighty way when his wife died, God specifically instructed a prophet, tell the man he needs to get a wife and a godly wife. God showed me this this week, and I want you to see why did God tell the prophet to tell, by the way, did the man receive the instruction? No, the man died. Not long off this trip to Europe, he died. Had he chose the wife, his labors would have extended. Listen to this quotation. Tell me, I want you to see, can marriage be a great blessing? Look at the quotation. This is from Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, page 34, 35. Ellen White's writing to Jane Andrews. She says, you remember I wrote to you from Texas to obtain a wife before you return to Europe. What did God tell him to do? Get a wife. Do you suppose I would have given you such advice if I had no light upon the matter? Be assured no such counsel would have been given given you without good reason. I was shown that you made a mistake in starting to Europe without a companion. If you had before starting, if, sorry, if you had before starting, selected you a godly woman, what kind of woman God wanted him to select? So remember, in order to get a godly woman, what, do you, what are the two things you need? So who chooses a godly woman for you? 
wisdom and understanding. So then we're going to have to go back and study how does wisdom choose? Do you know the Bible teaches me? I asked God, Lord, how would wisdom choose? And God showed me how wisdom chooses. Publicly speaking, wisdom gives you characteristics and if the person meets the characteristic, then wisdom says that's the one. <laughs> not in there. <laughs> not there. Not there. It's not there. It says here, yeah, I was shown... Oh, I read that part, right? Blue words. It says, if you, had, if you had, before starting, selected you a godly woman who could have been a mother to your children, you would have been, it would have, you would have done a wise thing. Watch this part. And your usefulness would have been tenfold to what it has been. What God says that if he had a godly partner by his side, this man that God used in this Adventist movement to establish our doctrines, what did God say if he chose a godly woman? His his work would have been tenfold greater. Tenfold greater had he got the companion that God wanted him to choose. Friends, do you know by choosing a companion, a right companion, now I'm coming to the married on Sabbath. I'm dealing with the unmarried now. Married, we're coming to you on Sabbath and we're going to talk about how to develop an Adventist home. We are starting with the unmarried first. What I'm going to say is this. If you select the right person, your part to heaven becomes tenfold easier. Do you know that if you select the wrong person, your part to heaven becomes, you know what I'm saying? Tenfold harder. It's not my words, that's God's word question. If Jay and Andrews chose the right part, partner, would his work be tenfold greater for God? Now, I want you to see Ellen White's writing in the same book to another man, and she's actually counseling the man. You know what? This woman, it's best. Yeah, she's making a lot of threats, but this, I see that this woman is demon-possessed. And inspiration says that it'll be better for if, because she is threatening him, she's going to take her life. And inspiration says it's best let the woman take her life. Inspiration says it'll be better if she takes you worth that down to hell. I want you to see what it says here. This is same book, page 78. Sister D, now she's talking to Sister D. She says, Sister D, I would not present this matter as I do. Were there not another life so closely bound up with yours? And the life of one whom God has chosen to be his servant. So I want you to understand this. This man who was married to the sister was demon-possessed. Specifically, God had called him to do a special work. And so I want you to see what the prophet says to this man whom God had called to do a special work that is linked to this woman and he's doing his best to try and get her out of that. Now listen to what, what, what the prophet says. This marriage, this marriage ought not to have been, but the step has been taken. So it's, can you see what the prophet says? It's not supposed to be, but what has already happened? The step was taken. God does not approve of divorce. Even if Satan married you, heaven does not approve of it. He doesn't care. If you make Satan marry you, God says you are now married. You now make the best of it. Make the best of it. And how many marriages are gay in York based on inspiration? Inspiration says that majority of marriages. So question, friends, if, what, do you, what is before marriage? What is before marriage? Courtship. So if you don't want to make a mistake here, what must you get right first? The issue of courtship. Courtship. So majority of marriages is a gay in York. Inspiration is saying majority and how many people received the mark of the beast majority majority now i want you to see what the prophet says she's speaking to this man who is now married to the sister listen to what she says she says this marriage ought not to have been but the step has been taken and for your husband the work of overcoming is now tenfold more severe than if he had never seen you so the prophet is saying that because now he has already married this man that God chosen to do a special work, God still wants him to do the work, but his, 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 his ability to now do it, it has become tenfold harder for him to fulfill what God has called him to do. Can you see it's either tenfold easier or it's tenfold harder? 
over the issue of choice. What you choose, wisdom and understanding is needed. Wisdom and understanding. And friends, I'm telling you, someone says, I'll pull the person up. I'll, pull, I'll tie them to me and spirit, I'll be strong. I'll pull them up. You'll pull them up for a month, a week, two days, and they'll pull you down. That don't work. You got battles to fight within and without. Now there's an extra battle to fight. So let's look at Genesis 6. Let's look at Genesis chapter 6. Messages to young people, page 455. Satan is busily engaged in uniting those who are wholly unsuited to each other. He exults in this work, for by it he can cause more misery and hopeless woe to the human family than exercising his cunning or his skill in any other direction. So if Satan wants to bring the most misery to the human family, what will he do? Unite people that are not suited for each other. What does inspiration call it? They are mated but not matched. You know what mated means? Male and female. That's mated. Do you know dogs? They're male and female, any male and female dog. But do you know what's a match? When it's not just male and female, it's male and female that are matched because why? What God has called them to do, they're able to do it as a couple. Now, I want us to see Genesis chapter 6. When Satan wanted to bring destruction upon the human family in order for the Spirit of God to be withdrawn from the human family, what did he lead them to do? Genesis chapter 6, verse 2. It says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. What did the sons of God see? The daughters of men, that they were what? Fair. Remember, as a jewel of gold is in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman without discretion. What caught the attention of the sons of God? Was it, was it outward beauty? What did they see? Inward beauty there that caused them to go for the daughters of men. It was outward beauty. And what did God say? It's like a jewel of gold in a swine's snout. It is no good. It says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives, take note, of all, not which the Lord chose, which they chose. Now watch what follows. Watch what follows in the next verse. So as they unmingle, they, there's, that, there's a, a, a marriages are taking place which heaven does not approve of. And I want you to see what was the result or the consequence. Look at the next verse. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. Question, when that unequally yoke took place, what did God say he's going to withdraw from planet Earth? What did God say he's going to withdraw? What did God say I'm from? His spirit. His spirit. His spirit, friends. Do you know, this is so serious. Inspiration says in the book Messages to Young People, page 441, she says to unite with an unbeliever. This is what the sons of God done. They were uniting themselves with unbelievers, these daughters of men. She says to unite with an unbeliever is to place yourself on Satan's ground. You grieve the spirit of God and forfeit his protection. Can you afford to have such odds against you in fighting the battle of everlasting life? What do you do to the spirit of God? She says you grieve the spirit of God and you forfeit his protection. And question, when the sons of God took the daughters of men, did God say, I'm going to leave them with my spirit forever? No. His spirit was withdrawn. His spirit, 120 years, he says, and it's up. Probation's closing. What was the issue? Marriage. Now, inspiration says that majority of marriages are gaily in yoke. My question is, how much is majority? What, 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 what is majority? What, what is it? How much is that? Someone said 99. Let's see what inspiration says. Inspiration says, in the red words, there is not one marriage in a hundred that results happily 
that bears the sanction of God and places the parties in a better position to glorify Him. How many marriages? Not one in a hundred. That's not one percent, friends. One percent is one in a hundred. She says, not one in a hundred bear the sanction of God and places the parties in a better position to glorify Him. Not one in a hundred. So question then, if not one in a hundred, then who, if, listen, if God has not one in a hundred marriages God approves of, then who are leading in those marriages? It is Satan. If it's not God, I'm saying, if it's not God, if God's not God, saying it's, it's, not, it's not glorifying him, then it's definitely Satan. Now what I'm going to say is, let's don't get confused for those who are married. Inspiration says, that even if it was a deception, or even if it was, Jesus can take the common waters and he can turn it into the wine of heaven. So even if we, God, God, God is able to take whatever mess, if one comes to God and says, Lord, we want to fix things, God can fix anything. Can God not fix anything? God can fix anything, friends. God can fix anything. So inspiration is saying, how many marriages are Kailin Yoke based on inspiration? Not one in a hundred. That's zero, one percent. <laughs> so, this is a serious thing. This is a serious thing. This is a serious thing. So, let us come back. Let us come back to this issue of wisdom and understanding. Of wisdom and understanding. So, God says in Proverbs eleven twenty two. That when you look for a partner, the person must have what? Discretion. As a jewel of gold is in a swine's snout, so is a beautiful woman without discretion. What is discretion? And where does it come from? What is discretion? And where does it come from? Let's see. Come with me to Isaiah 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Are we in Isaiah 28? I want us to see verse 26. Isaiah 28 verse 26. Tell me where does discretion come from or who has discretion? It says... For his God, talking about God, for his God doth instruct him to discretion and doth teach him. So where do people get discretion from based on this verse? God is the one that gives discretion. Now let us look at another verse. Come with me to Jeremiah 10 verse 12. Let's see an, a second witness on where does discretion come from. Jeremiah 10 verse 12. Jeremiah 10 verse 12. Talking about God, it says, He had made the earth by His power, He had established the world by His wisdom, and He had stretched out the heavens by His discretion. So, who is the person that has discretion? It's God. So, for a woman to have discretion, where must she get it from? God, it's not something she develops, it's something which she gets from God. So when God says we look for some, now we're going to come to the men, but I'm saying for the, for, how does a woman look for, but now for the men, God says that the person must have discretion. It mustn't just be outward beauty, it must be discretion. Discretion is discernment, it's understanding, it's wisdom, so to speak. And when I looked at this, Proverbs 11.22, as God brought it to my, to my attention, I asked the Lord, Lord, is there any example publicly of a woman that was fair and also had discretion? Fair means beautiful. And also had discretion. She was both fair and she had discretion in one. Okay, that is a good one, but we don't see it so clearly with Esther. Even though, yes, we can partially... <laughs> Come in your Bible to Samuels. 
Come into 1 Samuel chapter 25. Actually, yes, 1 Samuel 25. Now discretion has to do with understanding. 1 Samuel 25 verse 3. Tell me, do you see a woman that was beautiful and also had discretion and understanding? Take note in 1 Samuel 25 verse 3. It says, now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail. Listen to the description of Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding. That, does God say understanding must guide you to a partner? Good understanding, same thing as discretion. Good understanding, and take note, and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was Churlish and evil in his doing, and he was of the house of Caleb. So pause. So the Bible says that Abigail had understanding also to speak discretion, and she was beautiful. So I want you to see a description now, biblical description of understanding, this issue of understanding or discretion. Let's see it being played out. How it gets played out. Let's see in its, phys- in its literal sense, how does understanding look like? Now, before I read the verses, Nabal... Her David's servants came to me and said that, you know what, um, we were looking after your, all your cattle and no one, we made sure everything was safe. Please, can you give us something for all the work we have done for you? Just some food to eat. And Nabal chased them off and says, I know not David and so forth. He said some bad things and he sent them off. When David gets the tidings of what Nabal said, after they guarded his, 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 his cattle for a couple of days, David gets up with his men and he says, by tomorrow, this time, all of Nabal and his whole household, all his servants will be dead. And he takes his sword and his men get up. He's, by the way, he's fleeing from Saul. And he comes and he's on his way now to kill the whole house of Nabal. And the news comes to Abigail that David is on his way. He had actually sent for, for some food. You know what Abigail does? I want you to see publicly understanding or discretion being played out. Let's see what she does. Come with to verse 23. Actually, she sends actually food before, and you could read the old story. I'm not going to read the old story. But she sends food before, and before she gets to him. And she meets him on his way coming there. It says, And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground. Verse 24. And fell at his feet and said, take note what she says, upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. Let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience, hear the words of thine handmaid. Before I continue, let's pause there. When she comes to David, who does she, what does she do? She takes responsibility. She says, let this guilt be upon me. Let this iniquity be upon me. Now, her husband acts foolishly, but she says, let this iniquity be upon me. She continues, she says, verse 25, let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for his name is so as he. Nabal is his name, folly is with him, but I, I, thine handmaid, saw not the young man of my Lord, whom thou didst send. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord had withholding thee from coming to shed blood, from avenging thyself with thine own hand. Now let thine enemies and they that seek evil of my Lord be as Nabal. Now this blessing which thine handmaid had brought unto my Lord, let it even be given to unto the young men that follow my Lord. Verse 28. I pray thee, forgive the trespasses of thine handmaid. Who is she, who is, who, what is she doing here? She is taking responsibility for, for what Nabal done. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fights at the battles of the Lord, and evil had not been found in thee all thy days. And then she goes on and she speaks to David. Won't you say that this is discretion that this woman showed? Do you know what David does in verse 20, 32? Listen to what David says. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou 
which thou hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in the very deed as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which had kept me back from hurting thee, except thou didst hasten and come to meet me, surely thou had not been left unto neighbor. By the morning, am I reading right? Surely, surely, surely they had not been left unto neighbor by morning light anything that passed against the wall. What the David said he would have done had she not come out, everyone would have been dead by the morning. But he says that God, he said, blessed are you. You have actually stayed my hand from shedding innocent blood. What are we seeing as understanding and discretion? True question, would you say that this woman, Abigail, even though her husband acted foolishly and was wrong and sinful, did Abigail stand in the, would, would you say that she took responsibility for his wrongdoings and tried as far as possible to shield him from death? Do you know inspiration actually specifically speaks on this issue? Do you know Abigail actually safeguarded her husband to the point of risking her own life? Like she, proved, she was willing to risk her own life. David could have killed her on the spot, but she risked her own life and she says, let the iniquity be upon me. She threw herself in front. She says, let it be upon me. So the faults of her husband, she was willing to take the responsibility. A true wife, when you're looking for one, inspiration says in the book Adventist Home, that the heart of the wife will be the grave of the faults of the husband. You know it's a grave? You know it's a grave? When something gets put in the grave, people don't take it out. It's, it's, it's gone. It's gone. It's, it's, put, it's put in, in the ground. It cannot come out. Something that's buried is not coming out. And she says that the husband's heart should be the grave for the faults of the wife. Meaning a grave means, do you know that when somebody goes in the grave, there's no one that comes and look at the dead person? You know, once it's inside, people don't dig it up and look, let me see. No, no. It's covered, it's covered, you can't see anything. And she says that that's every husband and wife. She calls it a sacred circle. She says no one should be let in. The heart of the one must be the, where are there ever faults, the one must be in the graveyard. Their heart must be the graveyard of all the faults. That's one of the things that specifically a woman that has discretion or understanding based on the Bible is one that will defend her husband. Not to say that he does sin and then, oh, she's de- amping him up to do the sin. No, no, no. But wouldn't expose his faults. Wouldn't expose his faults. But not at the same time when reproof needs to be given in a gentle, loving manner, it must be given. It must be given. So, this is the issue of discretion or understanding we see in Abigail. Now let's look at the issue of wisdom. Come in your Bible. To, let's look at the issue of wisdom. Come in your Bible to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. James chapter 3. So what are the two things that must guide in the choice? Wisdom and understanding. Wisdom and understanding. Wisdom and understanding. I want us to see James chapter 3. James, the third chapter. Let us look at the issue of wisdom. When wisdom selects, I want you to see what wisdom does. What is the choice of wisdom? There's almost five characteristics, primarily in James, 5 verse 7, James 3 verse 17. Take note what it says in James chapter 3 verse 17. It says, but wisdom that is from above, what is the first thing? Pure. So when you're looking at wisdom, the first characteristic, when you're looking at wisdom, when wisdom chooses a partner, the first thing is purity, purity of life. That's the first characteristic. If wisdom is going to choose for you, it looks at purity of life. 
If someone's in courtship and a person is constantly tempting him to impurity, then wisdom is not going to tell you marry the person. Wisdom will not tell you to marry someone who's constantly a temptation to lead into impurity. What is the second thing wisdom will choose when wisdom is selecting for you? Peace. So if you're constantly with the person and every time, maybe every two, three weeks you're fighting, a month you're fighting, every, and, and that is in courtship, wisdom will not tell you to select that person. Why? Because what will the marriage life look like? A galen yoke. If constantly in courtship, courtship is the gauge. Courtship shows, should marriage take place, what will it look like? But let me say this, it's also possible that in courtship you don't see the full thing. Do you know in Adventist home she says that even at the marriage altar, she says they don't fully understand each other. At the marriage altar, of the courtship, she says many a couple, even at the marriage altar, don't fully understand. She says it just takes a few months and then, what does she call it? There's a specific word she uses. Sorry? something in that line, but it just takes just a few months of the marriage. And that so-called fascination with each other, once it wears away, she says, one or both parties wake up to their true condition and realize that they made a big mistake. But then she says, make the best of it. Make the best of it. So, one, purity when wisdom is choosing for you. Two, if constant fighting in courtship, that is, not, that is not the person. That is not, wisdom will not say this is the one. What is number three? Gentle. Gentle. You know what, what is gentle? Wow, friends, I don't know what's gentle. <laughs> okay. Let's see what, how does the Apostle Paul use this word. Let's see how Paul uses this word. In First Thessalonians. Let's see, in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. How does the Apostle Paul use the word gentle? He says, but, or we all there, it says, but we were gentle amongst you, even as a nurse cherished her children. So how, how does Paul use the word gentle? He says, as a nurse cherishes a child. How does a nurse handle a newborn baby? Yeah, it's gentle, cherry. She says that, that gentleness is there's a softness. So if the person is not gentle, they're always rough and tough and what a, mm-mm, gentle. <laughs> the person must be gentle. Even if it's, you, you know what, what, what do they call men that are kind? Gentlemen. If the party, you know, in courtship, he might open up the door for you, deceiving you. Time when you'll get married, open up the door yourself, jumps in the car, starts up the car. The man was a deceiver. <laughs> be careful of those men. Gentle. There must be manifesting gentleness, not only in courtship, but it must be carried over into the marriage. That's why it's a gentleman. What is the next characteristic? Easy to be entreated. Easy to be entreated. Is, is the person easy to speak to? Easy to be entreated. Can you speak to the person and come and just say, man, this is my concerns, like this is how I see things and I think maybe we should do things like this. And if the person blows a casket and all starts fighting, they're not easily entreated. Wisdom will not say select that person. Wisdom will say purity on the top of the list. Wisdom will say, is this person is a peacemaker? Do you have peace when you're with this person? Is a person gentle, easy to be entreated? 
You can speak to them about anything, even if it's about them. You can tell them, hey, this is what you've been, the person, they, they're willing to listen. Easy and treated. What else? Full of mercy and of good fruits. Without partiality, without hypocrisy. The fruits of righteousness is sown in peace to them that make peace. So the rest, God's basically said, the person must be a righteous person. In other words, they must be seeking the kingdom of heaven. They must be striving. But on the top of the list, purity, peace, gentleness, easily to be entreated. God says they must be hypocrites. Obviously, they must be seeking righteousness. So th- these are the things that wisdom is going to lead you to select. They must, there must be a tick for each one of these things. What is understanding? Discretion, we see it in Abigail. One that even when they see you make mistakes, even when they see, whether, it's, whether in courtship, whether it's between either or of the party, and they see mistakes getting made, they're not willing to go and speak about the mistakes. They're actually willing to defend even when the mistakes were made. That Abigail def- try, and, try and in some degree protect neighbor. Yes. So God says that when you look in, wisdom and understanding, wisdom and understanding. Now in Adventist home, we're going to conclude now. In Adventist home, I want you to see what she says here. This is Adventist home, page 45. Now in this page, she specifically tells you what characteristics or what questions you must ask before you take the step in marriage. There are certain questions you must ask. Does anybody know what question? Okay, for those who are married, I'm not asking you, but those who are not married, do you know what questions must be asked? Inspiration says, before one takes the step. Okay, what are the questions? (laughs) My brother, you're in danger. You're in great danger. You're in danger. How can you, friends? I'm saying you can't be saying I'm contemplating this issue and you don't know what questions must be asked. Inspiration says, now if you are married, I want to ask the married. Now since the unmarried don't know, then I'm going to give the married an opportunity to help the unmarried. So the unmarried can know when they're trying to select, this is what they must do. Sorry? <laughs> Why well, show me where it says that? <laughs> Inspiration says in that page, friends, you have to, I'm saying something that, that, you know what she says before I get to the questions that must be asked. She says in that same page, page 45, she says weigh every sentiment and watch every development in the character of the one in whom you are choosing to link your life destiny. What must you watch? every sentiment and watch every development of character in the one in whom you are thinking to link your life destiny. And you know, when I re- I've read this quotation many times, but this time when I read it in the week, God says, do you understand what you're reading, boy? He said, do you understand what you're reading? I said, Lord, explain. He says, the person you are marrying or would marry is going to determine your life destiny. What's life destiny? I said, Lord, where else would I find that in the spirit of prophecy? He directed me to Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 976. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for this will be the greatest for the people of God by which their eternal, there's the word, destiny will be decided. So he said, are you seeing the link that the person you're going to choose in marriage is going to determine whether you receive the mark or the seal? I said, Lord, I never ever saw that before in such clarity. I knew it in my mind, but I couldn't, I never see it publicly and spiritual prophecy so clearly. God says that that this thing, oh friends, I'm more convinced. Now, you know what many people do? They enter into courtship and they can be courting for maybe six months, a year, and even though they can see, man, this thing is not right, they don't have the moral strength to break away. They don't have the strength. Many, many marriages have been formed 
actually, let me say this, what God showed me in the book Adventist Home, he says that, actually the prophet says, inspiration says, that out of 10, 10 times she says, out of 10, 10 people, every 10 people that get married, she says their conscience tells them, don't take the step. Their conscience, she says, and she says out of the 10, she says every nine violates their conscience. Now that's not my statistics, that's God's statistics from the book Adventist Home. That their conscience tells them, don't do it. They still do it. Why? They don't have the moral courage to break away before the step is taken. And then when the step is taken, you know what? Then they try and muster up the moral courage. Where you want to go now? Where are you trying to go now? You chose to go there, now stay there. And make a little heaven now. There's no going nowhere. You are bound for life. She says in the book Adventist on 45, now back to the quotation, before we get to what must be looked for, she says, watch, or weigh every sentiment and watch every development in the character with the one in whom you think to link your life destiny. She says, this step you are about to take is one of the most important in your life. What does she say the step you're gonna take is one of the most important in your life? Outside of choosing Jesus, there's no other more important decision anyone will ever make than the issue of marriage. That I'm saying, under the, the, I'm saying the most important thing is choosing Jesus. I'm saying right next to that or under that, the second most important thing anyone can choose is who they're gonna marry. She continues and she says in the same book, she says, while you are to love in courtship, do not love blindly. She says, yes, love, but don't love blindly. May your eyes still be open to see. Then she says, before you take the step now, examine carefully. Now, what does examine carefully mean? Examine carefully. <laughs> Yeah, study, examine. If you're examining something, it's like if I'm giving you a money and you, you, you are already wary, hey man, this, this brother could be giving me false money or this person's giving me money that is not, it's not original, it's fake. You'll, you'll constantly keep looking at it. You'll put it up at the sun, you'll turn it around, you'll, you'll do everything, you'll try and you'll double check, you'll look at the original, you'll put the, the one you know is original, you'll keep looking at it to see, is this thing right? Examine carefully to see what must I see before I take the step, because she says, she says, oh, she says in the previous paragraph now, previous paragraph, she says, this step should not be taken hastily. That means you mustn't rush. Don't rush. Don't rush. If a sister tries to rush you, rebuke the sister and walk away. Or if the brother tries to rush you, rebuke the brother and walk away. She says it must not be taken hastily. And what if someone comes and says, the Lord told me to marry you? <laughs> Let me say this, people try that trick. <laughs> that trick don't work. <laughs> the Lord's not telling me nothing. <laughs> How did he bypass me? <laughs> but nonetheless, she says, examine carefully to see what must you see. Examine carefully. Does anybody know what must you examine before you take this step? No, no, that's a previous pattern. That, that, yes, you must do that. Check their character, watch every sentiment. How does the person handle certain situations? How are they with this situation? How are they with that situation? Now, listen, we are not saying, a, we're not saying perfection. Because you're not perfect yourself. You're striving. But when the person makes mistakes, are they willing to repent? Are they heart sorrowful? That, that's what you are looking to see, okay? Yeah, they're not perfect, but are they striving? She says, examine carefully to see whether the married life will be happy or inharmonious and wretched. So what must you examine to see how will the married life be like? Or inharmonious or wretched. So when you spend time with the person, 
You look in courtship and see how would a married life be? What do you mean, how? <laughs> you, that's why courtship was not one month and then you run to the marriage altar. Courtship was not two months and you run to the marriage altar. Courtship is as long as it takes to see the, the, the person's character. It's something that must not be rushed into because once you go into the door, it's shut behind. And there's no way out. No way out. Yeah. And the best way you get to know someone is by working with them. Work with them. A person, you get to know a person by working with them. You see what true character is by working with them. Do God's work. If the person, every time, let's go and do evangelistic work, the person don't want to go. person just wants to be in your society. That's already an indication, man. Uh -uh. The person cannot be caught up with you. I'm saying, as much as inspiration says there should be love, but she says the love must not be blind. As much as you're spiritual, the person cannot be placing you in the place of God. Where everything, man, the person just wants to be with you, just want to hear your words, just want nothing, no, that, that, that's wrong. Their eyes must be fixed on Jesus. She says, examine carefully to see whether the married life will be happy or inharmonious and wretched. Let the questions be asked. What questions must be asked? Let the questions be asked. Will this union help me heavenward? Will it increase my love for God? Will it enlarge my sphere of usefulness? Three questions. If these reflections give no drawback, then in the fear of God, move forward. What does inspiration say? The three questions I must ask, will this union with this person help me heavenward? In other words, will this person help me into God's kingdom? Not that you're depending on a person, but will our union together, will we be an aid to each other? Let me show you a verse in Ecclesiastes. Come with me to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, I want you to see what the Bible says on, concerning that. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Are we there? Verse 9. It says, two are better than one. Two is better than what? One. Because they have a good reward for their labor. Now listen to verse 10. Why is two better than one? For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he had not another to help him up. So the Bible is saying that God, now obviously, God's not calling everyone to marriage. But nonetheless, do you know, let me, let me, let's, let me just clarify this. Jay and Andrews, did God call him to remarry after his wife died? Do you know after James White died, um, what is his name? Uriah Smith wanted to marry Ellen White. He was also a pioneer. What did Ellen White say? No. So can you see that for Jane, what was good for Jane Andrews was not good for Ellen White. Do you know specifically that Ellen White says that God raised up Willie White, that when James White would die, that Willie White was to stand by her side. So yes, she needed, she needed someone, a male by her side, but God made sure that she had a son by her side to help her do the work that she needed to do. So yeah, the issue of two, if God calls the apostle Paul, was he married? No. Nope. So yes, this, this verse is true, but I'm saying God can also give strength to one. Some people are better adapted for just being alone. So those questions the prophet says must be asked, will this union help me heavenward? Two, will it increase my love for God? And number three, will it enlarge my sphere of usefulness? What, what does she mean when she says the question, will it enlarge my sphere of usefulness? What does that mean? Enlarging the sphere of usefulness. You know what's that? Will it make me a better person to help people? Your sphere of usefulness in God's service. So if the person, by me uniting with this person, will this person make me a better missionary for God? These things must be asked. And if it's all a yes, 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 then she says, in the fear of God, move forward, move forward, move forward. 
let's close here. Hmm. We'll have to come back to all this. stop here we'll stop here so what are the two things friends wisdom and understanding wisdom and understanding now if we don't want to fulfill the statistic of less than one percent how many how many people have an adventist home based on inspiration less than one percent then we must make sure that God leads and guides. Let's stop, let's pray. Sabbath, we look at the issue of what does an Adventist home look like. Let's pray. Loving Father, we want to thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much for the time we could have spent studying your word. Thank you for the principles you have revealed to us. And Father, I just pray, may these principles be a safe God to guide your children from making mistakes that will cause them to be lost. Father, even as we are nearing the end of the world, in Matthew chapter 24, we are told, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the coming of the Son of Man. What led to the close of probation in the days of Noah, the withdrawing of the spirits, was the issue of marriage, marriages that heaven did not approve of. And further, we also know that many a times Israel went to into apostasy because of making wrong decisions on the issue of marriage. It led them to false worship. We see this over and over again. We see that the wisest man, the strongest man, and the most spiritual man all fell on this point. Father, I just pray, please, Lord, I believe we are on the borders of the heavenly Canaan, and much of the history of ancient Israel will be repeated with modern Israel. For as ancient Israel were on the borders, we are told that women came into the camp and seduced men, and the cream of the crop of Israel fell on the very borders. Father, we are now on the borders I just pray may you protect your children from Satan's devices. Give them the strength that they need, Lord, both those present or those all over the world who might be contemplating this decision. Please, Lord, our eternal destiny hangs on this decision. Please, may you keep your children faithful and may none be ensnared by Satan. May wisdom and understanding guide and protect and lead your children in the choice of a life partner. Thank you so much, Father, for teaching us. We are truly thankful for the lesson. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Please may we encourage, impress every heart who has already developed a family or those who are seeking to develop a family to take up the book Adventist Home and to prayerfully study that book. Thank you so much, Lord, for hearing this prayer and for answering it, for we pray these things humbly, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing. But all the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king, and I shall see him face to face.